Welcome to the Tougher Minds podcast. I'm Andrew Whitelam. This episode is a special interview with Tougher Minds founder, Dr. John Finn. I asked him how he and his colleagues have developed the unique and award-winning Tougher Minds programs. I began the interview by asking Dr. John to explain what first attracted him to performance psychology. Well, the first recollection of thinking about performance psychology was actually in my dad's van. And I think we must have been driving to the, the driving range, the golf driving range, when I was a teenager. And I just distinctly remember on the radio, it was coverage of the British Open. And it was the British Open that the American golfer, John Daly, won. And I don't know what day of the competition it was, but he, he was leading or, or doing well. And the radio discussion was all about how John Daly had reported using, I suppose, what we call imagery. He'd reported seeing the shot he wanted to, he wanted to hit, seeing the outcome of the shot before he'd hit it. And the interesting thing that got my attention was they were discussing whether that was cheating or not, whether that should be actually allowed. So that's just that's the first time I can remember thinking about, I suppose, the mental side of performance. And then sport was something I was always okay at. I was okay at golf, I was okay at rugby, I was okay at football and cricket. And my uh, generation was the generation that where, where anyone, I suppose, was able to go to university. Um, and we were really encouraged to go to university. But I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And, and the advice was, well, just first and foremost, pick something that you think you'll enjoy. And sports science was becoming quite popular back then. So I picked a sports science type course um, because they had sport in it, I suppose. <laughs> That's the reason that I picked it. And then I, I just really connected with the sports psychology side of the course. I, I was studying physiology, psychology, nutrition, motor control. That's the science of how, how you learn, how you learn to move. I just got really interested in, in the psychology side. And, and I had one, one very specific moment at university where I, I'd been selected to play um, international student rugby. And I was selected in the training squad. We were working up to the Australia test match, which was quite a big deal. And we were playing in the warm-up game to that match. And I was full-back. And... Um, we played, it was sort of a wet, cold, windy day in the north of England. I think I was about 19. We were playing against a, a, a professional uh, men's team. And I just remember the, the ball going very high up in the air. And I was pretty much stood underneath my own posts. And the ball, it was like almost coming to me in slow motion. And all I can remember saying to myself in my head was, don't drop it, don't drop it. And then I started to say, you're going to drop it, you're going to drop it. And then, of course, I dropped the ball. The opposition scored a try. I didn't get selected for the Australia Test match. But the fallout of that was me saying to myself, wait a minute, you're supposed to be studying sports psychology. You need to do a better job of sort of taking advice from all these books and, and lectures that, that you're reading and attending. And that's kind of kicked, kicked me on then. And about that time as well, I'd, I'd, I'd ruptured my quad or one of my quads in my right leg. And uh, that, that really meant I couldn't, I couldn't train in, in a way that I needed to train to play high-level rugby anymore. So, so I knew that my rugby career or a serious rugby career wasn't going to happen. So I decided to really put my efforts and energies into the sports psychology side of my studies and I did a dissertation in that area. And then after my undergraduate degree, I went to work in America for a little while. And I remember getting the email from my uh, dissertation supervisor whilst I was in New York telling me that um, I got a first class in my dissertation and that meant that I could then go on to study sports psychology as a master's degree at the, the Institute of my, of my choice, which is really exciting. I suppose that was the start of, of my career in, uh, 
sports psychology, performance psychology. And the pathway was just really being interested in the broad concept, but also my own experience as a playing sport that really connected this idea that the brain is driving everything that we're doing. Yeah, it's not something that was ever really talked about. We spent an awful lot of time looking at the training on the fitness side and looking at the the, the, the tactics and the, and the and the technical stuff, but not really thinking too much about the mental side. So academic beginnings then, but John, tell us if you would about how you began your professional career in this area then. Yeah, so I, I completed a, a master's in sports psychology. And the first job that I got after that was working for a company called Prozone, which were which don't exist anymore. They're now, they're now owned by a company called uh, Stats, I think. But Prozone were a pioneering sports analytics company. And they had some technology where essentially they could put cameras into football stadiums, rugby stadiums, and those cameras would track player movements um, and therefore they could start to work out how far the players had run. But then on top of that, they would have people watching those videos and working out how many passes each player had made, sure whether short passes, whether long passes, how many tackles did people make. And it provided this in-depth in set of information for coaches and players to use to analyse their own performance. And Prozone, at the time, you know, had some of the biggest uh, sports teams in the world uh, as clients, including actually uh, Clive Woodward's England Rugby Union team. And they were using that technology for, for selection. They had it, had it for Franklin's Garden at Northampton's uh, stadium. So I was thrust straight into the world of elite sport. And my job was to help the coaches to use the product. And you know, I got to work with... Um, straight away people like the South African uh, rugby union team doing some work with uh, the goal kicker Percy Montgomery and using some of the stuff that I learned about developing pre-shot routines. So straight away you were thrust into the world of these sort of elite athletes. One of the clubs that Prozone provided services for was uh, Scunthorpe United. and They were uh, a training club, if you like, and the manager there was a guy called Brian Laws. He he played under Brian Clough at Nottingham Forest, uh, who's a I suppose a leg, legendary English football manager. And uh, I got on really well with Brian and, and his backroom staff, and I ended up actually going going to work for him, um, using my psychology skills and also helping them to analyse, you know, what was going on on the field during games. So. I went from working for a, a company that was providing services to professional sports teams to then starting to actually work for the professional sports teams. And at the same time, I also started to lecture at, in the Carnegie Faculty of um, Sport and Education at, at Leeds. And then I also started to work for the Professional Golfers Association as well at the same time. So. I, I played golf and I was really interested in, in, in working in golf and I'd done a little bit of that during my master's and that, that led to a connection at the Professional Golfers Association. Many people don't know that people that are called PGA pros, they actually have to do a, essentially a degree in golf. That's, that's their training to become a PGA pro. And traditionally that degree had three components. It had golf coaching, learning how to run a business, and then learning how to repair golf clubs. And around this time, the PGA were adding a fourth strand to the degree, which was sports science. And they were looking for people with expertise in sports psychology to come and help them to develop that part of the, the training program. So very quickly after finishing my master's degree, I had these three strands of work. One was working in the backroom staff in, in elite football in, in England. One was teaching, I suppose, the next generation of uh, sports scientists. And, and, and I was teaching physiology, psychology, and motor control. And then the other one was teaching the next generation of, of golf coaches. So 
lots of exciting things going on pretty quickly and you know learning lots all the time yeah and and how did you then start to develop the understanding of the vital importance of the brain of human behavior and of habits and hence the specific approaches to improving things like resilience and leadership that that tougher minds takes now i really got I'm pretty sure that in my undergraduate degree, we didn't mention the brain in any uh, serious way. But when I went to do my master's, the institute was very research focused and they were really keen to get under the bonnet of what was going on inside the human body and brain and to use those insights to you know, help athletes do better. Um, and they were, they were doing certainly pioneering work and there were several things going on at that institute, which was um, Manchester Metropolitan University, and then a very, very specific uh, sports science outfit there. And when, when I when I uh, joined, they were doing, for example, research for NASA, the space agency, and they were looking at muscle atrophy and the impact of uh, you know, the gravity essentially has on, on muscles. And they had these world leading physiologists uh, running those projects that we were taught by. Um, seriously clever people, but, you know, sometimes a bit dull and boring in their lectures. And I, think I fell asleep in one of them. <laughs> uh, one of the professor's lectures is the first time and only time it's ever happened to me but sort of genius people, but could be a little bit boring as well at the same time. Um, so, so it was that group of people there. There were another group of sports scientists that were you know, working with some of the, the top athletes in the UK at the time, people like Paula Radcliffe. And these scientists were people like Andy Jones, um, the physiologist. The work they would do, he was doing with Paula, like Paula Radcliffe was... You know, it was giving her that one percent extra advantage that were that was helping her to become the best in the world. Um, another another guy was working with uh, Denise Lewis, and these people were winning gold medals. And then the the sports side guys, what what I'd say, were uniquely interested in how the brain impacted performance. And learning and training and is it, sports psychology is quite a cl- quite a, a small community you know and subsequently when I've spoken to, to colleagues and friends that did similar de- master's degrees at other institutes they weren't looking at the same things we were looking at in terms of the brain so I, I believe what we were studying what was unique at the time and one, one of the things that was happening in that period was that functional MRI scanners were becoming a lot more accessible. And at the time, France, I think just as a country, had invested quite a lot into functional MRI scanners. So we were getting exposed to all this new research that was emerging from actually looking inside people's brains in real time, because that's what the functional MRI scanners allowed us to do. So just, the, just these fascinating insights. So that was, that really piqued my interest and we, we took a deep dive in many modules looking at you know the neuroscience of sports performance etc and then that interest just followed with me in my career so one of the research projects i undertook at manchester met was looking at mirror neurons and in fact we did two studies in that area um, and, and i took that same interest with me when i started to work at carnegie I set up other experiments where we were looking at the role of mirror neurons of learning and specifically learning how to perform under pressure. And then I suppose as I got exposed to how we were developing and training elite athletes, it became really apparent to me that we weren't helping them to understand their brain their brains we weren't helping them to understand how they could think more effectively using really good insights from neuroscience and behavioral science and that fascinated me because it 
it seemed like that part of their development was being left more to chance than the fitness side and the physical side. When I was working at Scunthorpe, we, in, the second, in my second season there, we won the league against all odds. We won the league by, we spent 58% less on player wages than the teams that came second and third. And this was a, a phenomenal achievement. And it was a UK record in professional football for the least amount of money spent on player wages for the most amount of league points gained. And I just got really interested in this and, I, and, and that kicked me onto my PhD, which I'll, I'll come on to in a little while. But one of the things that fascinated me was that Scunthorpe had this recruitment policy of going to much bigger teams, mainly Premier League teams, and buying their young, talented players that had first-team contracts but weren't getting in the match their squads regularly. So they were good players, but they were only maybe 18, 19, 20. And, and you know, they weren't better than Steven Gerrard or, or Wayne Rooney. So we'd often take these players on loan, see if they see if they if they were all they were cracked up to be, see if they fit into the culture of the team. And if we liked them, we typically signed them for about a hundred thousand pounds. But what happened to some of these players were that a few years later. They were worth millions. One player in particular, we bought him from his home, hometown club for £100,000. And if I'm right in remembering, about two years after that, we sold him back to the same team for about two and a half million. And he was their product ultimately. But I was seeing other examples, not necessarily at Scunthorpe, but I was seeing other examples of young, talented people who were, you know, the best thing since sliced bread when they were 18, 19, 20, but when they were 22, 23, no one was even prepared to pay them a, a salary anymore to be a professional athlete. And it occurred to me that it wasn't because they weren't physically fit and it, and it wasn't because they didn't have the technical and tactical skills to be a professional footballer. It was more be about what was going on in between their ears. Yet nobody had ever really deliberately taught them about what was going on in between their ears or what were, or how to actually start to manage that in a really structured way. So that kicked me on to, to pursue a PhD that explored is the reason that talented young athletes and I was examining, I suppose, the best athletes in the UK in, in, in soccer and rug, rugby, both codes, league and union and cricket. Is it the mental part of their performance that actually stops them fulfilling their potential or not? And can we actually teach them to be able to get better at developing the mental side of their game? And specifically, can we get better at helping them to regulate their emotions, which for me was and still is the key for being healthy, happy, and at your best. And within that piece, I was also interested in, can we develop these young people to become better leaders? Because that, that was another interesting thing I was observing at Scunthorpe was, essentially leadership transitions, you know, professional football is quite fluid and you have players and, sometimes staff moving in and out of your out of your your first team environment all the time and it was very striking to me the impact that certain people had sometimes in a really positive way sometimes in a really negative way on the group and the environment but again i didn't see a lot of very deliberate leadership development you know in in the academy structures so I wanted to use my PhD to learn more about how we could help young elite young athletes to do better. And my sense was that if we could help them to understand how their brain worked and how to use their brain more effectively in very simple terms, that would be helpful for not only them fulfilling their potential in their sport, but also broader life 
but also in helping them to become better leaders. Because you know, leadership's about influence ultimately. And if you can't influence your own behavior, first and foremost, you're going to struggle to influence other people's behavior. So that, that was one thing that got my interest, uh, what I was experiencing at Scunthorpe. Another thing that activated my interest in the brain and, and, and habits in particular was, I suppose, traditional mental skills training in sports psychology. I'd seen time and again that you could help athletes to understand that they needed to speak to themselves more helpfully under pressure or they needed to you know, use imagery to, to get better at controlling their thoughts. But it also was emerging that for some athletes that was quite an intangible idea. But also even if the athlete understood what they needed to do, so they knew what they had to do, they couldn't necessarily do it when the pressure came on. And in my master's degree, I would learned about this thing called functional equivalence, where if you want to learn how to get good at, let's say, taking a penalty under pressure, well, your practice has to mirror how you're going to feel under pressure as much as possible. Uh, something that we've now evolved actually into something of a T-tap model. But part of what I was doing at that time was I was I was teaching sort of mental skills training modules both at university and for the Professional Golfers Association, where I'd been tasked with helping golf coaches to help their clients to you know, think better as they were hitting golf balls, particularly under pressure. So. I knew there had to be a better way to teach people how to think. And we had to help people not just to know what they needed to do, but also help them to build this into a habit. And this is why I created what's called the, the pre-shop training program, which was essentially a tool that coaches could use or, or players could use. If we take golf as the example. So it was a two, it's a, the tool is made up of some big colored squares that you map out and lay out on the ground. So you might have a square before you hit the golf ball and you map some shots and some thoughts into that, some what we call focus words and focus pictures. And you might have another square as you're hitting the golf ball that again has some focus words and focus pictures. And then you have a, a square after you've hit the golf ball. So it was a much more tangible way to help the golfer in this case, to actually practice what they were thinking before, during, and after they were hitting the golf ball. And it gave them a really tangible way just to embed this way of thinking into their practice so that when they got onto the golf course, they could, they were in a, they had a much better chance of having, having those thinking habits drilled in, into what they were doing. And again, you know, outside of the, I suppose, the Scunthorpe and the PGA bubble, I was really extending my consultancy work. So I was, I, I, you know, I was working with some of the, some people that were deemed to be the best coaches and, and players of their kind in the world. And I was taking a, a huge interest in, I suppose, the best practices in, in athlete development and support. And again, I just felt that the psychological side was lacking and it was being left behind. And I felt the reason for that is because we weren't actually talking about people's brain and how the brain worked. And we weren't really understanding that this isn't about helping athletes to know more things. It's actually about help, helping athletes to build better habits so that what they know just becomes ingrained into what they do. So I'd learned an awful lot about how the brain work, how the brain, how brains work from my master's uh, degree. And I would carried on that pursuit. And I was just increasingly interested in using those insights to help people to do better. So I pursued my PhD so I could learn more about that, learn more about what was going on inside elite athletes' brains as they were going through challenging transitions, 
how did stress stress impact their thinking and could they learn how to think better and get better at regulating their emotions. I was evolving the pre-shot program, mainly with the PGA, but we've started to roll that into different sports, into uh, rugby and, and, and cricket, uh, into tennis uh, at that time to actually give coaches and athletes the tools that they could use on the field of play to practice thinking properly and building those better habits. And then, you know, in my consultancy work with, with the, the coaches and leaders that I was working with, I was just experimenting all the time on not how, not how do we get them to know what they need to do, how do we get them to turn that into a habit, turn, turn that stuff into habits. That led me into uh, not just knowing about how the brain worked, but actually experimenting with how can we get people to use that in their day-to-day -day athletic lives and use that information to do better both on the field of play, in training, and also in their broader life. And the experiences, the, the pathway, the journey that you've just described to us, John, um, that's part of, uh, a major part, in fact, of, of why you describe the, the, the black box theory in psychology or black box theories and a black box approaches to, to improving resilience, mental performance, leadership uh, as being flawed. Yeah, so the... The black box theories are theories about human behavior, why humans do what they do. But the, the theories don't actually consider what goes on inside people's brains. Yes, you, you heard me correctly. <laughs> but that's, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? So the vast, vast majority of the insights we have about why we do what we do and how we can do better in life actually don't take into account what goes on inside your brain because until maybe probably 20 25 years ago we didn't have the technology to look inside the brain in any kind of effective way then we got functional mri scanners that allowed us to do that and that kicked off what was called the decade of the brain. Um, before that, and, and still now, this the, the black box theory is still dominant, unfortunately. And just a real simple example. If you have a cup of coffee, that's the input. What's the output? Oh, well, you feel more awake and you have more energy. They're not actually looking at, well, what is going on? How, what does the coffee do to the brain function? How does it change what's going on in the brain? So... The decade of the brain allowed us to actually look inside the brain and say, if someone has a cup of coffee, what goes on inside the brain and then what impact does it have on their, you know, their physical behavior? For reasons that I, I suppose are explainable to, a, to an extent because humans do what is easiest for them to do, scientists haven't necessarily adopted um, and taken on board all of these insights that we've that we've garnered from neuroscience and increasingly behavioral science and they haven't used them to inform what they're doing and even if they have that hasn't necessarily filtered through to applied practice um so that that's what the black box theories mean our approach is that we do want to understand what goes on inside the brain and the reason behind that is because there's been some huge insights that have emerged from learning what actually goes on inside our brains and how that impacts what we're designed to do and, and what we're capable of doing. Some people talk, I think there's a website called Neurobollocks, excuse my language, not my too bleeped out, but that's what it's called. Um, and some people will still quote, yeah, but that's just a load of neuro bollocks. For me, that's lazy. There is a, a lot of real in-depth insight that's emerged from neuroscience that can inform and help us to do better in life. Some neuroscience is what we call confirmatory science. And it confirms what we already understood. But a lot of it, or certainly some of it, has given us some 
very different insights about what we are designed to do and what we are capable of doing. One of the big ones is neuroplasticity. You know, until the emergence of functional MRI scanners, we did not understand that our brain is changing or our brains are changing all the time. The brain is like plasticity. It's made up of about 100 billion neurons and it is changing all the time until the day that you die. New neurons are growing, other neurons are dying and being pruned away. Up until about 20, 25 years ago, we thought that when you stop physically growing, your brain literally stopped changing in any serious way. That's a seismic shift in our understanding of what we're capable of doing. And that type of work has flipped around the nature-nurture debate. We now understand that what we practice can be just as instructive to what we get good at as our, as our genes, as we, as we thought our genes once were. Another huge insight we've got we've gotten from neuroscience is just how um, attracted our brain is to threats and worries and problems. There's an old I think, management technique called the sandwich technique that says, give them a positive, give them a negative, give them another positive. Neuroscience shows that that isn't enough because our brain is magnetized towards a threat and negative emotions because it's a threat detection machine. So therefore, the, the one, the two to one, which is the sandwich technique, give them two positives and one negative, isn't enough. We now know that the negative is so heavy that it needs at least three positives, in very simple terms, and sometimes it, up to 11, or up, up to 15 positives to, to balance it out because our brain is designed to pay attention to the threat. Another thing that's emerged from uh, neuroscience is that the part of our brain, well, we have a part of our brain that's designed to make us pay attention to what other people think about us. So in our eight, our eight brain model, our eight ac acronym is Alive Perceived Energy. So the, P, the P perceived is about social status. The part of our brain that makes us aware and concerned about what other important people in our lives think about us is hardwired in to the parts of our brain that tell us we are thirsty and we are hungry. Now, so Maslow got this wrong. That our primary concern, or one of them, is what do people think about me? Because humans are not the biggest or fastest or strongest animal on the planet, but they are the best at working intelligently in teams. So when you're in a team, your survival chances go up, not only because of strength in numbers and you can become better at pro solving problems, but also because you've got a better chance of reproducing. So, again, being able to look inside the brain has showed us that, and that's really important if we want to help people to do better. Looking inside the brain has also showed us that the brain's number one operating rule is the easier it is to do something, the more likely it is you will do it. Our brain is designed to save energy, which is the E in it. This means that most of what we do most of the time is automatic or semi-automatic behavior, or in other words, it's a habit. You know, and we've seen these insights emerge from people like uh, Daniel Kahneman's work and uh, George Lakoff's work, but we're running most of the time on mindless behavior. So that, that's a seismic insight if we want to help people to do better. Another thing that the, the neuroscience has shown us is about brain maturation and the fact that our brains are not properly wired until we're in our mid-twenties. So the part of our brain that helps us to manage the limbic regions, the, the air brain if you like, is not properly wired for men until they're about 25 on average. 
or the ladies are about a year ahead of of, uh, of men. And maybe they're 23, 24 on average. That's a really important insight because again, we write off people when they're 16. We say, well, they'll they'll never be any good at this or they'll never be any good at that. Yeah, their brains aren't properly wired until they're into their mid twenties. And I think probably the f there's a, there's other there's other areas here we could talk about, but the, the final thing I'll point towards is that neuroscience has shown us that it's part of our brain, our prefrontal cortex, and, and areas within the prefrontal cortex that help us to deploy what neuroscientists call emotional regulation, what social scientists call self control, what we call hack helpful attention control, but what large sets of compelling data show are the most important parts of our brain for doing well in in the challenging modern world neuroscience has shown us that those parts of our brain can be strengthened through training so it doesn't matter how good we are at managing our emotions or deploying self-control or managing our attention in other words we can all learn to get better at it because these sites are like plasticine, they're trainable. So the, these insights are seismic and most people are not using them when they're helping people or trying to help people to do better. That's the equivalent of taking your car to a garage and the mechanic doesn't actually know how the engine of your car works, they're not going to be able to do a good job in fixing your car engine. So this is why I got so interested in, I suppose, the flaws in the traditional black box approaches because they miss out all these key insights that are so important for helping us to do better. So, John, the, the, these really significant scientific shifts in understanding these new insights uh, the insights that you yourself developed, the experiences you had. How did you then go about refining and channeling all this uh, to create the Tougher Minds programs that, that we now see today? A lot of hard work and practice, um, but a really opportune thing happened in my life where you know, I'd done the education, I'd, I'd done the, the degrees and the research, I'd been working on the application side and refining the application, innovating things like the pre-shot training program, um, working with some of the best coaches and, and, and athletes in the UK. And what was coming towards us on the horizon was the London 2012 Olympic Games, which was a huge thing for the country. And I was coming towards the end of my PhD research. And... Um, there's a, an organisation based in the city of London, or a charity, I think they'll be called, called the Haberdashers. Now, the Haberdashers are one of the founding livery companies, if I say that correctly. Uh, one of the founding fathers, if you like, of the city of London. And they were originally established to look after the haberdashery trade. And uh, I suppose they're sort of a membership body for that in a way. And like like many of the livery companies, the, the haberdashers have become almost educational charities, and they now spend their time you know, trying to do good. Um, and they have several different schools. One of the things that they do is they put up teaching fellowships where they want to bring in. experts into the school or into their schools that I suppose wouldn't traditionally be brought into a school in normal circumstances and there's a, a haberdasher who actually went to one of the mom or to the Monmouth school called uh, Colin or Sir Colin Moynihan who at the time was the the head of the British Olympic Association so he was heavily involved in getting the Olympic Games for the UK but also in, in managing that, that process and, and hosting the Games. So Colin Moynihan had been a minister, he was a sports minister 
and he, he was also an Olympic medalist. And as I understand it, he was involved in discussions around these teaching fellowships. And he brought the point that he'd always benefited from sport performance psychology, not just in his sporting career, but in every element of his life and his professional career and, and his personal life. And he was making the argument, why wouldn't you teach young people these skills from, a, from an early age? And essentially the, the haberdashers created a position, the sport or performance psychology teaching fellow for someone to go into the, the Monmouth schools with a, a blank piece of paper and say, right, how would you teach our young people sport slash performance psychology skills? And they chose me to, to fill that position because they liked the scientific approach I was taking. They liked that I had these tools like the pre-shot kit. I could just readily go in and, and start working with people. So I had a, a two-year window, I suppose, where I could really start to consolidate into a very deliberate training program. Lots of the ideas that I'd been developing through my, my own sporting career and through teaching uh, mental skills modules, motor control modules at university, through my work, uh, the PGA, through my consultancy work with elite athletes. I can channel all that together to start to create training programs, uh, not just for the young people, but for the teachers and for their parents as well. And that's what I did. And I was really lucky to work with some really open-minded people at Monmouth that were just really prepared to back me and uh, you know, give me the opportunity and the space to put these things into practice. You know, some of the results we saw were pretty phenomenal, where you would see in real time, I'm going to give a sporting example here. So in, in a school like Monmouth, there's some very you know, there's some very intelligent, academically intelligent children. Those academically intelligent children wouldn't necessarily always be great at sport because, in my understanding, they just hadn't practiced a lot. They hadn't practiced playing sport a lot, so they hadn't acquired sort of the basic movement patterns that you might need to be good at sport. And the traditional thinking would be that if that kid's not good at sport, but they're just not talented to be good at sport. So you know, it's just not their talent, if you like. When we started to actually get these guys deliberately thinking about what they were thinking when they were doing gymnastics or playing tennis or whatever it was, and, and plan their practice and reflect on their practice, we saw the rate of improvement was phenomenal. And these very established uh, teachers that had seen, you know, time and time again, children like this come through the system, were just gobsmacked how quickly these guys were learning to get better at moving and, and, and playing sport. And we saw these stories time and time again, and we, sit, we, you know, we still see them to, today. Um, and that, that can only happen that had a much better chance of happening because we were actually teaching those young people how their brain worked and how they could start to change their brain if they're practiced in a slightly different way. And then they start to get confidence because their practice is paying off. And it goes on like that. It becomes you know, self-fulfilling to an extent. But Monmouth for me was certainly very pivotal. And then that became, that word became the platform for tougher minds because what we got is lots of parents saying, well, one, I wish I'd have been taught this when I was at school. And then two, saying, do you work in businesses? Because this is far better than the stuff we're getting at work. And that led us into some of the biggest businesses in the world, in the city of London, where we then got, I suppose, our second big education programme, which, which was with Colf School, which is a leather seller school. Um, and we, we went to establish our business training program you know, through the recommendation of those parents. So that's how we, that's how we pulled it all together. So Tougher Minds now is in a, is in a context 
today where there's so much choice for people when they're considering things like improving their well-being, their resilience and their leadership. They have a vast array of information available to them, blogs, websites, quick tips, podcasts, apps, you name it, really. Um, what would you say to people when they're faced with this morass of information? You know, when they're trying to make the right choice, what's different about tougher minds, would you say? Yeah, I agree, Andrew, that there is more than ever. And even since we've been in this sort of COVID lockdown world, this is, this is it's grown, I think, more than ever. The, the range of insights that are available to people. But I think in the simplest terms, we have to think, if, what do I want to achieve? Do I want to know more information? Or do I actually want to change what I do? Because knowing something is very different to doing it. Let me give you an example. The vast majority of us know that we need to eat five portions of fruit and veg a day and that we need to walk 10,000 steps a day because the NHS has done a good job in, in educating us and that's you know, they've invested a lot of money into that. But yet, every year, the NHS also spend billions of pounds treating diseases, lifestyle-related diseases that emerge because people don't eat five fruit and veg a day and they don't walk 10,000 steps. So knowing and doing are two very different things. So the question you have to ask yourself is, what do you want to achieve from consuming the information that you consume? Do you just want to know some more stuff or do you actually want to build better habits? The difference with what we do is we actually teach people how to build better habits. A lot of the stuff that's out there just gives you, you know, the tips and the tricks. They don't change your behavior. If you want to feel better, if you want to perform better, if you want to do better, the only way to do that is to learn how to change your brain. And what I now know is that the only way to do that is to become a habit mechanic is to be consistently working on yourself and tweaking and refining your habits. Because the world that we live in now is so challenging that we're never going to get this perfect set of behaviours that see us through for the rest of our life, being the happiest, healthiest version of ourselves. We've got to keep working on ourselves because our, our life goes up and down. And we teach people to become habit mechanics so that when they notice themselves going down, they can recognize that more quickly and they can start to tweak their habits so they don't fall quite as far and they can start to you know, get back on track. But also when people recognize that they're doing well and they're on an upwards curve, if you like, that they can recognize that as well. And that if they need to, they can push themselves a bit harder if they need to, or they can, you know, step off the gas pedal if they need to. So it's about, um, I think, I think what, what we should be looking for is not just knowing more stuff, but actually doing things differently. And the only way we can do that is to build better habits. And for me, the big danger signs are, if, again, would you take your car to a garage where the mechanics don't actually know how the engine of the car works? I wouldn't. So if you're working with someone or you're taking advice from someone, the question is, do they understand how your brain works? Are they using old, traditional black box approaches? Or are they using new, modern approaches? And what I can see in the marketplace is there are, there are a couple of programs out there that use good insights into neuroscience. The vast majority don't. They're still using old traditional platform models. But insights into neuroscience aren't enough. We also have to use behavioral science to help us to build new habits. And as far as I can see, tougher minds and the habit mechanic approach is unique in combining both neuroscience and behavioral science to actually help people to understand how their brain works, but also to systemat systematically and consistently start building 
you know, small new helpful habits that help that help you to, to feel and perform better. So, so there'd be some of the things I'd be thinking about. So, so tell us then, John, if you would as well, what, what sort of experience do people have when they actually take up and engage with a Tougher Minds program for either resilience or, or leadership development? Yeah, well, what we always want to do first and foremost is help people to understand how their brain works, not so that they can label every single little bit of the brain, because that's not that helpful. We just want to give people a good functional understanding of what goes on inside their brain and why that might make their life more difficult, but also what parts of the brain they can change to make their life easier. So that's how we always start. And then what we do is we train people to become habit mechanics so that they can start to analyze their habits and build new ones. And to do that, we teach them to be able to do me power conditioning. And we, we, have a, we have a structured program. So we have level one habit mechanic, which anyone can sign up for free. And we have a level two habit mechanic program, which is where we teach people how to you know, do me power conditioning. Once you can consistently understand and, and put ideas into practice that help you to be at your best more often, then if you want to, you can start to learn how to help others to be at their best more often. In other words, you can become a leader or what we call a chief habit mechanic. So once you've done uh, me power, once you learn how to do me power conditioning, we then teach people how to become team power leaders or chief habit mechanics. And we have, a, we have tools that we've developed that allow people to analyze a team's habits to analyze their leadership habits and help themselves and their team to just to consistently keep building better habits that makes it easier for for the team to do well and for you to keep improving and learning as a leader uh, we have a, we have a coaching program for that we also have a, an, off, an off the shelf program so at the heart of what we do is we teach people how their brain works. We teach them how to become habit mechanics so they can, first of all, learn to analyze their own habits, to be at their best more often. And then we teach people how to become leaders. And, and John, of course, you work with so many, so many different people, so with individuals, with many major businesses, many major organizations. What are the benefits that people and teams report to you and how do the programs actually help them? Yeah, well, we're making a transition now from the old world of work into a new world of work. And this is making the training that Tougher Minds offers even more important because actually what we're going to be much more dependent on now is people being even better at managing themselves in a very challenging world because we're, we're asking people to work more flexibly remotely. So we're asking people to work outside of the company's traditional culture every day because when you're not in the in the office building surrounded by people it's harder for the culture to actually influence your behavior so fundamentally the first thing that tougher minds programs do is they help people to get better at managing themselves starting with their sleep their diet their exercise their stress their confidence their productivity performing under pressure whatever it is and i think the simplest way to explain this is that there's only 24 hours in a day that's all that we've got and you can imagine that your day is like a barcode. So, but instead of a, a, a black and white barcode, think of it as a red and blue barcode. So the red lines represent times of the, of the day when you're doing and thinking things that are not very helpful for you being at your best. The blue lines represent times when you are thinking and doing things that are helping you to be at your best. So in the most basic the, the most basic thing that the Tougher Minds program helps people to do is get rid of some of those red lines. And the core thing that we hear people reporting when they learn how to analyze their habits and build new ones, become habit mechanics, is that they save at least one hour per day. Because we all spend, and it's broadly invisible to us, we don't see ourselves doing it unless we go looking for it. We're all spending lots of time every day worrying, beating ourselves up, you know, getting distracted, not prioritizing getting enough sleep, 
not prioritizing getting out for a walk whatever it is and that stuff quickly adds up you know to 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 hour or hours and our programs are proven to help people to you know get rid of those unhelpful things so that's one level of, of, of how we help people the next level up then is that leadership and leading is more difficult than it's ever has been before because we live in a world called the VUCA world where the only constant is change and actually it's just been made more difficult because now we're asking our leaders to lead remotely most people have been promoted to leadership positions because they're good at getting into a room with people bringing energy and positive influence but that superpower has just been taken away from them so we help leaders to become much more rounded so that they don't only need to be in a room with people to get good at influencing their behavior they can do that from a distance as well so we help people to also understand how their brain is working but also how their people's brains work and we help them to build better leadership habits so that they can create cultures that make it really easy for their people to do what they need them to do to help the, to help teams work well um, and our leadership model has four core parts it's got the role model the action communicator the cultural architect and the swap coach we help coaches to build better habits in all four of those areas and then was the third thing connected to those first two things that we help businesses to do uh, and, and, and team and you know, sports teams, etc., to do is to function better as a team. Again, in the business world, teamwork just got more difficult as we move to more agile ways of working. So we have some tools that help teams to analyze their team habits and ultimately build better ones so that they've got their very best chance of being a high performing, you know, world class team, even when they're working remotely. So we help people to get better at managing themselves. We help leaders to be better leaders and we, we help teams to function better. You know, and I think that one of the things that's quite invisible to most of us is that culture is just a collection of habits. So, you know, habits drive everything that we do. They're so fundamental, but actually we can analyze them and we can help people to build better ones. Uh, and if we take that approach, it's much easier to, not only improve our individual performance, but also to improve our collective performance, not only in teams, but also across entire organizations. And you know, we've seen that time and again. And if we can just help people to understand how their brain works, teach them to be habit mechanics, part of the organization full of chief habit mechanics as well, then you know, happiness and performance just, just come because everyone is doing the right things every day to be a better version of themselves and also to help the team fulfill its potential. Well, John, some fantastic experiences that you've relayed to us, some amazing stories of scientific insight and development. Um, what can people do now to find out more and start to benefit from Tougher Minds programmes themselves? Yeah, well, I think that what we need to understand is that if, if you want to be... Um, feel better, if you want to perform better, the only way to do that is to learn how to change your brain. And the only solution to doing that is, is learning how to become a, a habit mechanic. You know, and I want as many people to learn how to do this as possible. So, so we've created a, the level one habit mechanic program, which is absolutely free. Anyone can sign up, just go to the homepage of the website and you'll, you'll get shown where that is. So. If you want to be a better version of yourself, you've got to start to become a habit mechanic and anyone can sign up for level one for free to do that. If you want to help your people and your team to fulfill their potential in what is a very challenging world, the only way to do that is, is to help your people to get their brains working properly. And the best way that you can do that is to learn how to become a chief habit mechanic. Again, I want to help people to do that. So if you go to the homepage of our website, we've created a free 
um, how to use leadership science to become a world class leader workshop where you can learn more about how you know how you can become a, a chief how mechanic and use leadership science to help your team to fulfill their potential. So go to the homepage of the website and start accessing the free resources, I think is the first good step. That was Tougher Minds founder, Dr. John Finn, bringing this podcast to a conclusion. Remember, if you want to feel better and perform better every day, learning how to change your brain is the key. But the only way to truly do this is to become a habit mechanic. To learn more and to access the Level 1 Habit Mechanic course for free, visit tougherminds.co.uk. Thanks for listening.